Salamat datang. Welcome, welcome. Good morning to you here in this hall in Kuala Lumpur. And hello to all colleagues all over the world that you are joining us through the streaming today. It gives me a great pleasure to share this president session. That's president's apostrophe S, but it would have been called president's S apostrophe. So thank you. It's our president's session. Because I'm honored to have the extraordinary participation of five of the most important people in the IFLA family. People who have led our organization over this last 10 years. Last March, in my president's meeting in Barcelona, our keynote speaker was Professor Rafael Ramirez, director of the Oxford Scenarios Program at Oxford University in the United Kingdom, one of the world's leading experts. Yeah, wait a minute. Take us time. I will continue here because if not, it's going to take us time. And as I was telling you last March, this uh, Professor Rafael Ramirez, uh, that he is the leading expert of scenarios planning, he said, "The only certain thing about the future is that it's coming at us. By coming together." sharing perspectives and developing plausible scenarios, we can develop strategies that give us the best chance of succeeding. Good advice from Rafael Ramirez. And easy to follow it because this is something that is in our hands. And of course, I encourage you, all of you, to read this chapter in this year's trend reports update. Because today, for the first time at an IFLA conference, we are bringing together six presidents on the stage. Six IFLA presidents sharing our views and insights. Bringing you, to all of you, our ideas, our experience, and our energy. The main aim of this session is to explore the subjects of mindset change as a basic requirement to transform our organization and achieve our vision, IFLA's vision. So, in this session, we will look into the process of IFLA transformation and the importance of its leadership in motivating and inspiring and igniting change. So let's come together and set the scene. You will agree with me that it's a real privilege for me to be here with five past presidents on the stage. They will come. They are now sitting in the first room, but they will come later on. Taking about mindset change, talking about mindset change, and we are still more than privileged, counting also with Sylvia Modic, that uh, she, she's going to lead us thinking about the external mindset. So Sylvia uh, will give us her point of view from the walls of politics and journalism, but also being the president of the Finnish Library Association. So it's a very, very, really uh, complete role of Sylvia. The second part, we will be shifted by the focus on an external mindset. mindset. So, I will underline that libraries do not exist in a vacuum, but are embedded in their communities and reliant of their support. And we will come with our Secretary General that will moderate this, this discussion. Firstly, we will have our guest speaker, Sylvia Modic, in this second part of the session, and then two more IFLA past presidents will join them by sitting our events and people who have inspired me to push IFLA to put libraries on the agenda. And as a climax of the session, 
IFLA Secretary General will present the summary report of the IFLA Global Vision Discussions first phase and make an exciting announcement about how you can join us in making this change happen. To start uh, this part, this first part, allow me to share um, my thoughts, uh, what, I'm, what I'm thinking that is important uh, of uh, mindset change internally and how this fits on my own agenda. So, I will start now with my, my keynote. I will do here, because if not, I still don't have my <laughs> headset. And as you know, IFLA is an organization in a stage of change. From the outside, it may look fixed, timeless. And it's, if it runs like um, a work clock, following well-defined cycles and schedules and year after year, decade after decade, 91 year all organization, decade after decade. But I can tell you that something exciting is happening. You will have heard this uh, yesterday in our speeches, the Secretary General of mine, um, and that IFLA is moving, is moving into the future. And with the global library field as well, working together, moving together, because it's the reason that IFLA can uh, change in itself, moving together with the library field. We are an organization, a field blessed with a great record. As I underline in my introduction, I am, I'm only the latest on a long line of IFLA presidents. We have just a few of them here, but the, the list is really long. Brilliant mindsets, uh, inspiring leaders, exceptional ambassadors of the profession for th this organization. They ha have given us an amazing gift, a knowledge, an experience, a, a wisdom. Not just a foundation of, for a solid construction, but a launch path for a new voyage. It's an honor to share a stage with them. In the journey we are talking, taking now, we cannot have wished for a better start or stronger advisors. Thank you to your inspiration. I come from Barcelona. I was honored to welcome many of you in my president's meeting in March of this year, held in the Maritime Museum. It was not a coincidence. The, the, the venue was chosen because the site, the former royal shipyards of Barcelona, had been there since the 13th century. The current building, already 60, uh, 60 hundred, uh, 19 years old, and those that you were there can tell how special is this venue in Barcelona. And those uh, ship jars, those of the best part of the Millennium ships, were built to took people out to the sea. Fishermen, traders, explorers, it was a dangerous job. Catalan folklore is full of these sad stories. But thanks to the links people made through traveling, trading, talking, it was a very connected time as well. It was very impressive to have this harbor there and people going through the Mediterranean everywhere and then to America. The knowledge and experience for the Christian, Muslims, and classical worlds was coming together. Products of, uh, and ideas from China and India were increasingly common. In, in his collection, uh, one of the best uh, Catalan folklorist, Joan Amadas, talked about a Catalan sailor having a grandeur of soul, which put him far above the society around him. That readiness to face the unknown, uncertain, and go out and discover something new. We had no, no new lands now to discover. 
we really don't have all lands we know here in the, in the earth is already discovered. No, we don't have. But we have a new world to discover, one that is shaped by our, our connections, our shared energy, our shared actions, by our grandeur of soul. One that is full of libraries acting as motors of change at the individual, societal, and global levels. Because people also need information to navigate the world. And libraries are the institutions that provide this in a meaningful way. They are the heart of a positive agenda for personal, societal, and sustainable development. To realize this potential into the future, we need both to make the most of resources we have, that knowledge, that experience, that wisdom. Not least that our past presidents, and we must combine it with a, the, a mindset to go further. With these ide ideas, with this energy, we can transform libraries, transform IFLA, and transform the lives of billions of people our community serves. We are very powerful because we are in contact with people, and this is the main, the main reason to really go further and provide them what they need. I want to go deeper into this subject of mindset and how we can change this within our profession. I like to talk, at, uh, sorry, I like to take some examples from my own experience about my own journey, about why I want to be an influencer. I really want to be an influencer. As you know, already, I started working in IFLA many years ago, so I feel like I have the experience of IFLA work over time. I'm a public librarian, a proud public librarian, but I have also, yeah, very proud to be a public librarian, by the way. But I have also worked in the national associations, been the national librarian of Spain, my country, and have engaged at the European level. And now I'm here as president of IFLA. At all levels, I can see that what the work is expecting of libraries, and library world, library, uh, the world is expecting of libraries is its own change. We really have to change. Why? Traditionally, our institutions have mainly been based in, on collections, on facilities, and on providing access to information that looks to the past rather than focusing to the, on the future. We have a social duty, a mission, to build citizens, not consumers, citizens, this does us credit, makes us unique. But the risk building the citizens of the past, this is a risk as well. So we need to look ahead, ask ourselves what are the characteristics of the citizens of the future? What is the society that we will be serving in the future? And use the answers to reorientate our services identify and size new opportunities. The future will not wait for us. Events might not, maybe not be kind to our institutions. I saw the impact of the financial crisis on people, on myself as well, and the impact of the cuts that followed on libraries. Misguided cuts, cuts that showed a lack of understanding that libraries are the invest an investment, are really an investment, not a cost. This is the problem. We really need to tell our uh, decision makers that they should invest in libraries. Libraries are, is an investment for uh, society development. Face this mess these changes, both opportunities and threats, we are too often a profession marked by passivity, by fatalism. For me, this is absurd because we are very powerful and we really have to, and to throw away our power to everybody. Libraries have long been drivers of pioneering ideas and innovation 
from support for cutting-edge research to making a reality of literacy for all. They have shown a capacity for leadership in their communities and worldwide. I would like to repeat something that I really think is important to keep in our minds. Libraries do not need to be the victims of change. They do not have to sprint to keep up the change. They can drive the change. This is important. We can drive the change. So these changes underline to me the need for a mindset change within librarianship. We have to, the resources. Sometimes we think we have very low resources, but we have the resources. But where is the lack of this last click? We need, we need a click, a change, that last spark that turns potential into delivery. What is the mindset we need? I like to take a lesson from educational psychology that it makes us clear sample. A lesson about lessons. The wall of Carol Wick and at the Stanford University focuses on a student's mindset. It shows that a key fact factor of success is how we react when we face with a challenge. In her case, a math problem mathematics problem that was a little too hard for a class of students. Some of them lost confidence. The problem was too difficult, required too much energy. They felt stupid that everyone who had told them how clever they were, how smart, had been wrong. So they gave up. But others enjoyed it. The challenge made their brains run faster, set off the connections, got them exploring. They may not have got the right answer, but they gained from the process. And these were the students who did best. The innovators, the creators, the problem solvers, the solution finders. So, good news for those who have, have the mindset, but can it be taught? Fortunately, the answer seems to be yes. Studies of the, of the power of feedback offer the evidence, evidence. The traditional approach is to congratulate the smarter children on their intelligence and tell the others that they are wrong. Yes, you are smart, or not, you are not. Neither help. The children told they were smart, gave up easily when faced with problems that were too hard, like the one I mentioned earlier. It did not make sense. They were smart, yet they could solve the problem. They couldn't solve the problem. So the problem was too impossible for them. The children who were told uh, they were wrong before didn't even try. So they were wrong, but did try. We had to try. We had really to try. However, there was an alternative. Those children who performed well were congratulated on their effort. The teacher focused on the process. This is the important thing. Focus on the process. The hard work that went into a finding and an answer. This is the main thing. We had to find answers in the process. Those children who failed were encouraged to all that they did not have the right answer yet, but with work, they could in the future. This is the plan. This is the plan we have to see in our vision. Going to answers for the future. Try and try again. Follow and try again. So, at this group, I started to do, to do better, not to give up, to show more resilience. A huge, a huge success. Their difficult problems became their favorite ones, and they advanced faster and with more confidence. We need confidence. 
we have to look for confidence. Now, realizing the potential of libraries in the modern world, reorienting services to meet the needs of our changing society, warranting the financial sustainability, sizing opportunities, building a truly united global library field. This is a little more complicated than a school match problem, of course, it is, we know. But I think it's the same mindset what we need to deliver on both. To change the world, we have to change our, ourselves, build our resilience, build up our resilience, create those connections, those neural connections that make IFLA into the world's biggest library brain's trust. We have the resources, we have the brain. We, ha we have to be uh, a knowledge that we, we, they can trust in us. Fight the fatalism, develop the bravery and the mental strength and to meet our challenges. I can be an influencer. I really can be an influencer. As I underline, I'm a privilege in my position as president of IFLA nowadays, and I can really be an influencer. I can take the bird eye view of the library field, see what is happening, take the temperature, and then, in turn, I can share my message. Offer you support, motivation, reassurance that the global library field is behind you in your efforts. Encourage you to adopt this positive mindset. Is what I'm doing through my slogan, Libraries Motors of Change. This is my call to you. A call to, the, to believe that not only in, in what libraries can do for society today, but in what they can do far into the future. To be confident in the face of difficulty, to look forward the challenge with excitement, to have a dream, a vision for the future, and work to turn this vision into reality, into action, and to learn new skills along the way. Because as Scott Adams says, every skill you acquire doubles your odds of success. So success in anything means focus and effort. Try, value, try, value. Focus and effort. Nothing worthwhile is easy. But together, with focus on what we want to become and hard work, we can create this new path for IFLA, for libraries globally. I know uh, we are lucky to have such a this hardworking Secretary General leading IFLA on transformation efforts and is an example for all of us. But you will hear more later from, from what is the plans for the future. But I have to tell you that plans to build a better connected, more resilient, more innovative and inclusive IFLA is up to all of us. Because IFLA is us. IFLA is not something in the headquarters in the Hague. IFLA is the main brain trust in the library field. So we can be influencers. We really can be influencers. But for all the work, me, myself, Gerald, the IFLA team, the president elect, members of the board. This cannot be enough. You too need to be influencers, all of you, and you can be influencers, I'm totally sure. The fact you are here, I think, is a sign that you have this positive mindset. The mindset we need to transform the library field. And after this conference, you need to go home and influence others, to change their mindset, to show your leadership, because you are all leaders in your fields. You may not necessarily have a title, a team to run, a desk, 
or a door with your name on it. But these are not the things that make a leader, absolutely not. It is the ability to convince, to inspire, to bring people with you. The leaders are the ones with the ideas, who can articulate them, who can change mindsets, and opens the door not only to create uh, a cre the greater uh, well-being for ourselves, but also for the billions of people our community serves. We are serving the whole humanity. We have to do. Yes, it's true. We, we have really to think that we are doing this job together. So, as Deborah Jacobs used to say, let's celebrate our success because we, are, we can really be very successful in this. Both the success we achieve and the hard work that makes them happen. We have so much to do, not least within ourselves, but I know we can. Thank you. So now it's uh, over to my colleagues. I would like to uh, you join me in the, on the stage. Three of my predecessors will join us now, and each will share the insights into mindsets and mindset change within the library field. Firstly, I would like to welcome Ingrid Parin to the stage. Please, Ingrid, come join us. Let me give her a warm applause. Ingrid uh, brought extensive experience from the Canadian Library field to her work in IFLA. Hello, Ingrid. Stay here. Stay here with me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, uh, she has been university librarian at the University of British Columbia, Director General of Acquisitions and Bibliographic Services at the former National Library of Canada, and Assistant Deputy Minister for Documentary Heritage and Library and Archives Canada. Ingrid was president of IFLA from 2011-2013, and chose libraries as a force of change as her presidential team. She focused her president's meeting on our digital futures and indigenous knowledge, presided over conferences in Helsinki and Singapore, the last time we were in Asia. So she has continued to support IFLA and its work actively, still she does, in particular around digital heritage and engagement with our strategic partners. Ingrid, welcome, or oh, as you said, welcome back. And now you have the micro to give us your short keynote, but we want really to know more about your theme, about your thoughts. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias, Gloria. De nada, Ingrid. Oh, de nada. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much, Gloria, for that introduction and really for this opportunity to share uh, the experiences of five former IFLA presidents, and I guess some of their growing pains too, if I can call it that, uh, during their time as IFLA presidents. Um, it's not something you really can prepare for, uh, and things come up unexpectedly, and so you have to react quickly um, and work for the benefit of all the libraries in the world. Um, as Gloria said, I was IFLA president from 2011 to 2013. It, it does seem like a long time ago, uh, but I must say it was one of the most exciting and inspiring times of my professional career. And it also seems such a long time ago in terms of society and how fast things now have developed 
in, in relation to the economics, the politics, and the technologies that we have to deal with. So it's been a, it's been a time of change for sure, but I think we were always thinking about change uh, when, when I was president. And when I reflect back on my attitudes and mindsets at that time, um, I think that through the vision and the actions that I and the members of the governing board, and they were superb, we had great collaboration uh, with members together, um, we were trying to change mindsets, but we didn't call it that at the time. I think the term is something that now is very popular, but then we didn't call it that. We, we were just trying to make sure that libraries were promoted for the extremely valuable role that they play and the contributions that they make to the communities that they serve. So my theme really was libraries a force for change. And I think, like Gloria said, we have power. We, we are forceful. And we can make the change that needs to be done. And in my theme, I had four elements, inclusion, diversity, collaboration, and convergence. And you know, we do provide access to information, so that's clear. But what do you do with that information? What do people do with that information? We really wanted our users around the world to use the information they acquired through libraries to make change in their own lives and in the lives of their communities. So we were the instigators of change, and we can change people's lives, and they in turn change other lives in their own environments. So it's this cascading chain of change. Now, one of my top priorities was diversity and inclusion. Um, and this applied to attracting more members to IFLA, and I think it was very important to say that we are strong, we will be stronger if around the world people support us, librarians support IFLA and its vision and its, its purpose. And so I devoted a lot of time to um, areas of the world like the Middle East um, and Latin America. And I also tried, and we tried to make our operations and our outputs, our products of IFLA more multilingual because I think we need to have that aspect in all that we do, so that we reach out to the people around the world, so they understand us better. So that was and is a change of mindset that is really hard to implement. Um, I found that in the library world, but also I think it, it's, it's a, a matter of also other professions and also in other countries to change the mindset to include diversity and inclusion um, by others. and. Um, how do you do that to incorporate into your daily lives, not just in libraries, but in communities? And think of the migrant crisis that we have now. It's very hard to make people change how they think about things like that. And it's something that libraries, I think our global network of libraries, we can set an inspiring example for other, other areas in our global village. So this change of mindset would include enlightened leadership and actions to back up the vision for an inclusive society. And it will be a constant challenge for all of us over the next decade for sure. And, but I believe that we in libraries, we're well on our way to achieving this objective. And I just want to conclude this, this piece um, by uh, talking about my first IFLA, uh, which was in Barcelona in 1993, 25 years ago. And I looked up the program at the time. Um, and I thank all IFLA staff, really, for putting the, the programs and still having them online because it's important to archive what IFLA does. Um, those of you who are newcomers to IFLA, I think, can appreciate that how an overwhelming experience it was to come to your first IFLA. And I felt that in 1993. Now, when I looked at the program, it seemed very rigid in its structure. It talked about cataloging and acquisitions and document delivery. Um, I don't imagine that they would have had a program on library fashion, what we're going to hear tomorrow at this conference. <laughs> and even, you know, there's going to be a lot of humor in some sessions about social media. How do we use social media today? Uh, to, to make it attractive, to make us more visible to our users. 
Um, and at 25 years ago, of course, it didn't exist. So, but there were things that were really a change of mindset 25 years ago. There were sessions on quality management, on performance reviews, um, on the gap between North and South. There was also a session on newest technology, CD-ROMs. Uh, so we were ahead of the game already, you know, 25 years ago. And also I want to mention one last thing. There was a session on women in leadership and in libraries. And it was led by our dear Marta Terry at the time. Um, and I was really touched that, you know, she took the initiative to say women are important in the profession and we do have a role. And, you know, she led a great group of people then. So I think, in, in summary, we're doing extremely well in our profession. I think we are ahead of the curve. Um, we just have to make sure that others know about it, that they know what libraries are capable of, and that they can collaborate with us to bring about the positive results that we want for our communities. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ingrid. I will stay here, because if not, you are going to be alone, and it's not nice with our guest. And now I will welcome to Sinica, Sinica Sipila. First to talk about Sinica, uh, I wanted really to, to uh, thank you, Ingrid, for your insights, really. I, I really appreciate your talks. I was inspired to run for GB member uh, after a talk with you, so I have really to appreciate <laughs> your advice. Thank you very much. Sinica, please join us. Sinica Sipila um, also brings very strong experience from the national level, serving for many years as Secretary General of the Finnish Library Association. But she was also active uh, internationally long before her work with IFLA, advising programs connecting Finnish and African universities. Uh, maybe many people does not know this, and I want really to remark that uh, you were so active in this uh, field. Sinica was president of IFLA from 2013 to 2015, and her theme was a very well-known a strong libraries, a strong societies. Her president's meeting focused on the impact of libraries in society and on transforming libraries, very relevant given the theme of this conference. She was IFLA president during our conferences in Lyon, France, and Cape Town, South Africa. And as a co-chair of the National Committee for our 2012 uh, Congress in Helsinki, she certainly knows how much this sort of events means. So, Sinica, welcome. Give us your uh, speech. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria, for the invitation, uh, introduction. And thank you very much for IFLA for their invitation to address the audience at this, this session. It's great to see so many of you here today and think about the mindset change, what it means for our profession. As mentioned already, my, my theme was strong libraries, strong societies. I chose that theme because I wanted to uh, emphasize the role and impact of libraries in socioeconomic development and stress how society benefits from developing its libraries. The better libraries are, are developed and resourced, the better they can serve their user communities. As, as libraries allow people to find information they need for their work, their studies, their everyday life, and they can become active citizens, and that benefits the society. When I think about the question of a mindset change within my, our profession, how it fitted with my focus and my theme, I, th I believe it fitted quite well. Our field had started to think out of box, so to say. For instance, surveys of, um, have been conducted on the economic impact of libraries. 
and other impact as well for society. This mindset change was evident also in the work of IFLA in the way it inf influenced uh, the Agenda 2030 that happened during my, my term, the UN Programme for Sustainable Development. And Donna will tell more about it. But it, uh, I will mention it here because that work was very well fitting to the focus I had on of the development, how the libraries influenced the development. And that was the focus also in the Agenda 2030. And that work was very successful as libraries have their places, place now in Agenda 2030 and also on many uh, national development plans. And when I think about my theme and uh, the mindset during my presidency, I think there were, there were much, much interest towards my, my focus. Many colleagues appreciated that it gave libraries more importance when they realized that they were part of a bigger picture. And then it, that inspired them to adopt new mindset in their work. It gave all, them also tools when talking to the politicians and decision makers. In Namibia, there was um, Africa, a Namibia Library Symposium devoted to my theme. Speakers from all over the all over Africa related examples about how their libraries support national development plans, education and knowledge creation, e-learning, and human rights in Africa. We also heard presentations on how to create awareness of the importance of libraries, how libraries empower communities and build stronger societies. There were also questions in some countries, uh, how to implement the theme, as librarians felt that they had too few libraries and they were poorly resourced. They, they, they thought this posed challenges when they strive to influence their development. Situations do differ from country to country, and then it's important to have a clear vision how to best develop libraries. And it's critical to remind the politicians and decision makers on the way, many ways in which libraries can benefit the society. And this can require a mindset change to see the possi possibilities and seize the opportunities. It's hard to say exactly how, what has been the impact of my theme on the mindsets within the library field. I can only speak about my own experience. And here is one example. I was very honored when the theme for the Lithuanian National Library Week in 2016 was named Strong Libraries, Strong Societies. This highlight, highlighted to me that my theme had been useful for the Lithuanian colleagues as they wanted to use it in their own work in promoting libraries. It's my hope and belief that my focus and, and the theme has provided encouragement and acted as an inspiration to colleagues in the library and information field. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm grateful for your ideas. Can you sit with us? So let's welcome now to Ellen Thais. <laughs> Warm applause to Ellen. Hello, again. <laughs> Ellen is a senior director of the Library and Information Services at the University of Stellenbosch, South Africa. But this has only ever been part of her work, I know. Because she has been a member of the UNESCO Memory of the World International Advisory Committee, chair the board of the National Library of South Africa, being president of the Library and Information Association of South Africa, and of course, of IFLA itself from uh, 29 to 2011. And she's still more than active, really. 
She picked libraries driving access to knowledge as her presidential theme and focused her president's meeting on engagement in the knowledge economy and driving access. Her presidency includes our conferences in Gothenburg and San Juan de Puerto Rico. Ellen, it's great to welcome you on the stage. Please give us your address. Thank you very much, um, Gloria. Um, and um, good morning to everybody. Um, so some of you have been here for over an hour, so um, I'm going to try and also be very short. Uh, we only have five minutes. Of course, five minutes is too short to actually speak about your journey um, as becoming an IFLA president and being an IFLA president. Um, so, so I will just try and keep, keep to some of, some of the highlights. Um, firstly, I, I want to, to say you will note from the presidents on the stage um, and uh, maybe if you had a quiz, I'll ask you, what is the difference between me and the other presidents? Um, so I represent, to a large extent, the Global South. Uh, we will have another president coming after Gloria from the Global South, and before Claudia, there were also two presidents from the Global South. But more than that, I also represent probably a large part of the world, which is the developing world. And as such, I've always seen it as my responsibility um, as the IFLA president to represent that part, those parts of the world, um, and to make sure that we become part of this global organization and participate more in it um, as um, professionals. Um, as, as Gloria had said, my, my theme was uh, libraries driving access to knowledge. I followed uh, Claudia Lux. She, her theme, which she will obviously speak about later, was um, putting libraries on the agenda. Now, and there was a lot that was done on that. So when you're on the agenda and you're at the table, what do you do? <laughs> what, what, so what? You're now on the agenda. What do you do? Um, and I think I was trying to build on that by saying, you know, that we are important, libraries are important, and libraries within this change that has happened in the world in terms of the information society, the knowledge societies, it is important that libraries and that we have to dis make the distinction on how d distinct libraries uh, are in terms of our role and that we need to come to the table and step up to show that we are in fact the drivers to access to knowledge because we are the only institution, the only public institution in the world where we can provide access equally to everybody. Doesn't matter, you can be the richest person in the world or you can be the poorest person in the world. You can be of any race, of any color, but as when you walk into the library, nobody asks you how much money you have. Nobody asks you if you can pay to use the services of the library. You come in and we're all equal. And that's, that was the main theme and the main aim of what I was trying to say through my presidential uh, term. But just, just to highlight um, some of the areas that I, in my theme that I had uh, focus on, and that was to say, and this has to do with the mindset and the change and what the mindset at the time was. And I just want to say it was very important because remember the internet, all, all the people that have now provided access to information, etc., and we had to compete. Uh, but of course, as I said, you know, we're actually much better than all our competitors, and we had to build on that. And there were the four areas that I said that we should focus on and change our mindset, and then libraries will remain relevant in society. Libraries and librarians must become more user-oriented. You know, we get so tired, we don't have money, people come to the library, and sometimes we're not even friendly in helping them anymore. But you must become more user-oriented. Libraries and librarians must become active in advocacy by actively promoting libraries. Libraries and librarians must create partnerships and foster opportunities for convergence. And in addition, participants, and that was the people that were actually gave input, the IFLA members, that libraries as space and place should foster 
information for all and access for all. So those, those were the areas um, that, that I had focused on. And I think the things that have changed, of course, uh, then again, the other presidents, of course, also followed on and they took specifically areas that they felt at the time when they were presidents that they would like to focus on. But I think some of the things have changed. As a result, the mindset, if you go now, there are wow libraries that you find in many parts of the world, new libraries that have been built, make it more inclusive, made it more user-orientated, speak to the needs of the communities, etc. cetera. Um, and then, of course, um, also the fact that libraries have been afraid, you know, oh, we don't know much, we were afraid of IT, um, and this thing about, you know, oh, I'm just a librarian, you know, um, and so on, you know, it's like, you know, we actually, sorry, to, sometimes it sounded like you're sorry to be a librarian. And in fact, as we say, you know, and through IFLA, what we want to do is to empower you, you know, to make sure, no, you're not, you're not just a librarian. You are a librarian and the best librarian. You are a knowledge provider. You are an information provider. You are empowering other people. And I think that is what we wanted to say. And just before, I want to end, but also just mention, you know, maybe just one or two of highlights of my uh, presidency. And the one is, um, following on the agenda thing, for me it was important, that was my main thrust. And it went back to being involved in IFLA, in faith, freedom of access, expression of information. And then of course the whole era about open access, but it was based on the declaration of new, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. That access to information is a human right. And that is our one thing, again, where we can stand out that we have to fight for, that we have to fight even governments if they do not make sure that that access is guaranteed. And we have to do that. That's why it's so important for libraries to continue. Then I just want to mention, you know, some of the highlights certainly for me had been participating the first World Summit on the Information Society, representing IFLA at WIPO in Geneva to talk about access and why we need to consider and really make libraries part. And I think that is also was possible as we have developed, like with the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Develop, IFLA created those platforms. It started with the World Summit on the Information Society in Geneva. You know, having been able to go to China for the 100 year celebrations, UNESCO participating in that. But the important thing was that I have learned through my presidency and where I think we can influence this and why IFLA is such a powerful organization. And it wasn't perhaps, you know, the things that we have on the, web, on the website and all of those things, but it's actually going to a country, a country where we've never been, a country where you f find professions that are really, you know, they, they, they can't, they want to hear more, they want to be part of this global community. And I think if we may have to make some kind of assessment to see before my presidency perhaps, how many people from developing countries or from Africa have actually attended IFLA? Because if I know when I started in IFLA in 1997, maybe, maybe 100. From South Africa, maybe 10 or 12 people or 20 people have attended. But I know since then, or if you go and host a conference in a country where you haven't been, you will see the change. That's how IFLA becomes more and more global. So I know my time is up. So I want to, to end with, um, with just one thing. On my way here, I was um, um, sitting in the airplane and there was a newspaper. And it was, a news, it was an article on a library, a new library that they were building uh, in, a, in, in one of the rural towns in South Africa and in an informal settlement. And, um, and I read this and I thought, you know, this is exactly what my theme was about. And this is what I, what I want you to leave with in terms of why I think we need to continue. Our work is not done. We are trying to drive access, but I don't think we have achieved this that we've seen as really how important and why we still have to continue to fight for this. And this is what some of the speakers said uh, in the article at this, uh, this library. They said, a library play a fundamental role in a society as it is a gateway to knowledge and culture. Library not only, libraries not only are educational facilities, but could create job opportunities. 
Construction of this library will put food on the tables and some of, of, of some of our households. The resources and services they offer create opportunities for learning, support literacy and education. They also shape new ideas and perspectives that are central to a creative and innovative society. Libraries are giving energy for imagination to flourish. They open windows into the world and inspire us towards improving the lives in our communities. And it's a place where social inclusion can thrive. Later on, we will have more opportunities, but if I have to, and I'll just say very quickly, Gloria. Very, very quickly. Preempting, <laughs> we have to ask, one of the questions would be, you know, if we have to have a slogan, a, 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 a slogan for IFLA, what would that be? And if I have today to choose a slogan and a presidential theme, then I would say, yes, we can. <laughs> yes, we can. This is your message. Thank you, Ellen. Really, thank you. So, uh, I have really now to ask you some questions, because if not, it's just uh, giving you your address, and, and we need much more of you uh, to explore your ideas, your experience. So let's go more in deep. I have um, um, one question uh, for Ingrid. Uh, it's, a long, it's a long question, but uh, you, will, you, will, you will answer. As part of your presidential theme, you cited uh, a, a participant in the past uh, conference who underlined that we must not be prisoners of our preconceptions. We need to reconsider our attitudes and assumptions. It was a pleasure to read this when I was looking for information to, for today, and it's it's read really echoes what I hope we can do when we talk about mindset change. For you, this is the question now, what, are you, what do you think are these preconceptions and why are they so strong? And how did you, in your presidency, seek to break out of this situation? I think it's not an easy question, but you will, you will answer. Thank you. Uh, Madam President, you have a very good memory because that was something that was said, I think, in 2010 in Gothenburg. Uh, there was a, a delegate who said, we are prisoners of our preconceptions. And I think this is really a, um, a fore, forerunner of what we're talking about today with the change of mindset. And I, when you talk about prison or prisoners, of course, you have walls. And sometimes I think we believe we are in silos. We work as a profession, we exchange information, but we're talking to the converted uh, in many ways. It's nice to influence, nice to inspire, nice to encourage, but we deal in a global world and there are other people around that we need to build collaborations and, um, and networking together. There's a saying um, I heard about the walls of preconception um, and in a prison. Um, and it is when the winds of change blow, there are some of us who build walls. Yep. But there are also some of us who build windmills. And I think that's the that's this maybe a slogan we can also think about in terms of how do we break down those walls of preconceptions. I think librarians um, in general, have a, have a sense of knowing a lot. Uh, in my experience, um, you know, we know how to acquire things. We know how to organize information. We know how to serve our users, we think. But we don't. I think we have to be very careful that we don't stay in those preconceptions that we've had for many, many years. It's very hard to change those ideas that have been around for, for decades um, of how we should work. But I think we need to break down those walls. And we need to get more input from not just librarians, but from our colleagues in other strategic areas. We need to have the support of governments to say, this is what we want to do. How do we do yeah. it best? And we want to be a partner with you because we have so much to contribute. And we can influence as well. So I think it's a great uh, phrase. Um, and it's something we need to remember. But we also need to remember we have to break down those walls. 
and we have to do things differently to achieve the results that we want for our users. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, let's go now to Sinica. Regarding um, you became president in, in 2013, and you talk about how libraries had helped Finland concretely transform from a poor agrarian economy to a modern way of a sustainable econ uh, agrarian economy. So, um, uh, you, you really think through this providing access to information and education, uh, our institutions build a stronger society. You said many times in your speeches, uh, yet of course technology, economies and societies have moved on uh, later on. Do libraries have, this is the concrete question, do libraries have what it takes to accompany this continued evaluation? Do you think libraries have this? Well, the world has changed, of course, uh, but libraries have their role to play today, too. And now there is no lack of information and knowledge. It can, we can find it through many, many uh, ways. And I think now libraries have a different role than when it really helped Finland to, to develop by giving people a chance to find the information they needed. Now I think libraries are very important in um, sh showing people or teaching people what information is reliable, for instance, because we have so much disinformation and fake news. We want to offer in libraries uh, reliable information, and that is something we can uh, teach people through media or information literacy. And that's a very important part nowadays. Uh, the technological uh, development is very fast and, and very expensive. So um, that is a challenge to libraries, of course, nowadays to, to accompany this, it is. this evolution. It is. it is really. Thank you. Thank you, Sinica, for your thoughts. Um, let's go now to Ellen. So, um, during your presidency, you, play, you place a major focus on the importance of access to knowledge for personal development and fulfillment. Just as CIFLA has been doing secondly at the United Nations and around the world, you underline that this access must be equitable. You said already in your speech, libraries if they are open to all members of their communities, can be forced for progress and fairness. You said really, poor and rich people, they can get into information because libraries are there and must be there to, to facilitate the access. What mindset changes does this imply for you as concerns that the way the libraries work with the users? What evolutions did you see during your presidency at the moment that in this way? Um, uh, th uh, thank you very much um, for, for the question. Um, I, I think I, I'll just respond by adding um, a couple of um, additional points uh, to that uh, because I think I've also addressed some of, some of the mindsets that have changed. And, and some of the changes that I've seen and some of those uh, libraries that have really, librarians that have taken this up are in the following areas. Um, firstly, as I said, um, and ended off by, you know, we can do this. We, we, we are the information leaders um, and experts um, in this field. They created, uh, started to create libraries um, um, uh, for example, I've seen in countries like Finland, I've seen in Germany, I, see, I saw in, in, in uh, several other countries. Um, some of the, the changes that have taken place, um, developments over the last um, uh, two decades or so, in terms of climate change, the issue around immigrants. So I've seen libraries providing um, services specifically for immigrants. Um, I've seen um, how libraries have taken on the issue around climate change, green libraries, green environments, how they have changed. Mm -hmm. They realize we have to make it, we can make it possible 
we have a role to play. We can also do something. Libraries, countries that are dealing with poverty, unemployment, how we can use the libraries, how the libraries and the change in terms of the users is how can we empower the users? Because if we are empowered, we can empower our libraries. And I think those for me are really some of the major changes that have taken place and where libraries have started to see and librarians mm -hmm. that we can contribute, that we can make a difference. And if we can tell governments, if you want to reduce poverty, if you want to reduce unemployment, uh, drive, libraries are drivers for economic development, for economic change, for innovation, and so on. And then we will get the funding and the resources that we need. Yeah, I really think that you, you are right and the, the change happened and, and for us it's easier now because we have an agenda, the 2030 agenda, that is the transformation of the world. And most of uh, uh, nations, uh, countries are really following these steps. So they are including in their own initiatives of development the way that people, uh, the literate, literate people can really achieve these goals. So now it's easier for us, but at that moment, I had really to thank you because it was an inspiring uh, speech and achievement because we were not thinking about uh, several uh, fields that were not just library fields, research fields, community uh, information skills. We, you really uh, opened this door to us. So later on, we saw that this can be possible and IFLA is really working on it. And uh, with the Lyon Declaration, uh, starting in Lyon with Sinica, that we really wanted the U United Nations members to think about the importance of being into information, uh, giving facilities to information. Thank you, thank you, Ellen. So I'm now going to Sinica uh, for a short uh, question. Um, let me see. Uh, you also highlighted the connection between libraries and democrat democratic ideas of freedom and access to information and knowledge. How far did you see this connection at, wo at, at work during your time as president? Uh, what were you able to promote it? For me, the idea of libraries and the democratic ideal of freedom and access to information and knowledge are very close to each other. In fact, the two sides of the same coin, so to say. And I could see the connection uh, that at work in many countries during my time as president. Usually those countries where people have freedom and access to information, information and knowledge are the most successful countries. And um, I was able to promote this, these ideas by talking about them to politicians, uh, decision makers and media in many countries. So, thank you. Thank you because it's, it's, it's really important to, to follow the steps and see what we are getting at the end. I mean, you are always lashing ideas, but, but it's, it's, it's good to have back the results. So, and now this question is for Ingrid. Are you ready? <laughs> we are not in a profession famous for being noisy or table, but we will, be, we, will, we will be in the future, I'm totally sure. Yet in our presentation, in your presidential theme, you talk about the importance of, uh, li li no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about, I think I'm, I'm mis, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm now lost. Sorry about, I was repeating a question. Um, uh, you also uh, highlight the connection between libraries and democratic ideals for freedom and access to information and knowledge. How far do you see this connection? How to promote, yeah, as well. I want to, to, to combine the... Mm -hmm. um, access to knowledge and freedom of expression and libraries just go hand in hand, as we know. Um, I am... Um, 
I was in Tunisia in 2011 when I was president, and it was such an exciting time because there was a, a feeling there was this democratization of information, of knowledge. And that was due to the beginnings of social media. Um, and it was, you know, people were just so thrilled to have access to information where before they had less information. That was the beginning of the Arab Spring, if, if you remember. Um, and, you know, it didn't quite turn out the way it, we thought it might. But I think that's, that's probably the result of um, actions that take place and unexpected things happen. There's more developments. Um, social media is such a positive force in many ways to improve mm -hmm, access to mm -hmm. information. But you know, we're now seeing some negative sides to social media and some, some cyber bullying, some invasion of privacy, um, and some things that we call fake news too. So we've, we have to be very careful in our libraries that we understand what is access to information, what kind of information, how do we help that? Um, and I think that's, it's a developing area that we probably didn't foresee, you know, 10 years ago, but now we have to address it. And I think we are capable of addressing it. Thank you, thank you. My, my, my question for the, this uh, uh, way to change things um, for the passion was for Ellen. I mean, uh, because maybe we, we are from the South and we are talking in a different way. We are saying the same things, but uh, we have a different energy, I think. So uh, the way we are moving our, uh, waving our arms and so. So um, what mark, um, what do you think um, we can provide as librarians of, uh, as, uh, to our libraries to being seen as a exciting profession as a exciting place to go into the studies, to, uh, to really be part of this community, because they have, I know that many high schools and librarianship schools, they have problems, if they, they don't have enough students. What do you think we have to do to change this? Very brief, please, because we have to finish. Yes, I think that's actually a, a very hard question to, to, to answer, but, but I think the one thing that I would like to, to see or think that libraries should really do, and that they've already started to do to a large extent, um, is it, really to create spaces um, that provide for social inclusion. Because if we, if we include everybody, if we address issues around, long, you know, if we don't see the differences, but rather what are the common things as you have just indicated, if we can do that, then everybody will feel part, they will feel part of the community and so on. So in terms of uh, what can we do to make it more exciting and why I think we do a lot, we should make more videos this, uh, um, in terms of song and dance. Um, tell, we heard about the fashion and so on. But I think, of course, social media, that's where we have to be because that's where the young people are. But, but I think we have to create more content, visual content that basically speaks because people um, uh, uh, respond much better to that and not in paper. So more visual content, more stuff that uh, not the, from the way we think about it, but from the way and ask the users to do it themselves, that they create the content to make it, to show how exciting libraries actually are. So thank you. Let's uh, applause these uh, three grand thinkers. Thank you very much for your contribution. Stay, 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 don't, don't leave. We then really to have the big picture of the six presidents plus the president of the uh, Finnish Library Association. Thank you really for your great uh, conversation. I hope uh, we will uh, get over these uh, conversations after giving a coffee and talking more together. This is always important. Thinking about uh, what you said, I feel excited to the future changing our mindsets, getting ourselves ready to face the future, to turn challenges into opportunities, as I said. But I, this is, won't be easy. I really think it's complicated. But we will, we can, as you said. We can be done, uh, not just here, but in libraries across the world. As I said at the beginning, however, it's not only our mindsets that count. 
To open the second part of our session, I would like to invite to the stage the man who is leading such a profound change within IFLA, that is our Secretary General, Gerald Leiner. Can you come here, please? He does not need any presentation. Of course, you know him very well. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Ingrid, Sinica, and Ellen. I guess this was a wonderful start of uh, the session, and you know now why IFLA is so great. We, are, we had great leaders in the past, and this enables us to build up on them, on their work which they have done. This change is only possible because we had great leaders in the past, and uh, as you know all from your experience, an institution can be only successful in a permanent change, taking always the best from the history, taking this as a legacy to make it even better, to adapt it to the future. And this is exactly what IFLA is doing, and therefore we are so thankful to have our past presidents here to work with us. And I got from this one hour already so many ideas what we can do better, and I guess we should use this resource, this incredible inspiration of our past leaders for the future. This is the intention of uh, this session. So, it's now the second part, where we will look outside, metaphorically at least, because, as we said, no, island, no library is an island, and this means also the whole library field is not an island. Libraries are always embedded in institutions, always part of something, a university, a government, an institution, a parliament, a nation. But most important, they are serving their community. And I just want to cite here from our global vision report, which is the result of the input from colleagues from 190 countries of the world, from all library organizations. This means there is important uh, input from the whole world. And here it is stated. We are focused on serving on our communities, regardless of how we define community, we share a deep commitment to meeting users' needs. We have value diversity, inclusion, and the importance of providing a non-commercial public space. But here is also the opportunity or the challenge as opportunity number three. We need to understand community needs better and design services for impact. Expanding library outreach will help, will help link with local partners, engage new and universal sections of our communities, and have a measurable impact of people's lives. I guess this is exactly what our three past presidents said, and, and, and it's exactly what uh, Ellen uh, underlined in her uh, thoughts. And we are going there because this is what gives libraries their power, their ability to make a difference. Because they are there working in partnership with users, helping them access information they need to make their life a better one. But it also means for us that we are in a disagree of uh, dependency for fundings for suitable laws and regulations for status. We need to pay attention to the actions, the priorities of those who make decisions about our institutions, just as we pay attention to the needs of the people we serve. And there is where the mindset change comes in, because the future of libraries is safest is most promising when the decision makers and those who influence them see the importance of libraries 
value our institutions, when they don't only feel sympathy, but also they see the necessity to drive to act. And this is the subject of the second part. And I'm proud to say that we have, that we will be joined by Claudia Lux, Donna Schida, and our current president, Gloria Perez Almaron, to talk about this. But first, I'm happy to welcome Silvia Modig on the stage. Silvia is president of the Finnish Library Association as well as member of the Finnish parliament and city councillor of the capital of, of Finland, Helsinki. In these roles, as I know, we will hear she's been closely involved in the spectacular library opening uh, of the Helsinki City Library. She, is all, she has also played an active role in education, housing and environmental policy. And she's also, what is important from my point of view, journalist over with 25 years experience on both television and radio, given how powerful media and politics shaping our mindset, it's great to have her and to get her insights. Sylvia, the stage is yours. Thank you for your kind words. You put the expectations really high, so thanks a lot. Uh, thank you for everybody. <laughs> thank you for, to the presidents for your inspiring words. Uh, this is my first IFLA, and I'm very excited and very happy to be here and be a part of the IFLA family. I'm the new president of the Finnish Library Association, and I've just started my work, and this is a great opportunity to be here to share with you the story of Audi, our new central library. Can you put the first picture, or should I put it? There you go. Here you can see the building in the middle. This is our new central library called Audi. It will open its doors uh, in December of this year. And I hope this story will inspire you and give you ideas for this topic of changing mindsets. Uh, the libraries have always been a fundamental part of the Finnish society. We love and we value our libraries. We have always seen them as a fundamental part in what we call the welfare state. It's, they have an essential role in culture and education. But yet, Audi is the biggest single investment made in the library in my whole lifetime, even if we have this appreciation. It's a new building. It's located in the central part in the middle of Helsinki, our capital. And it's a huge financial investment of 100 million euros, which is very exceptional. Uh, it is also very symbolic that it is located just next opposite to our parliament building. And this we feel that is an important symbol, uh, which symbolizes democracy and freedom. And we hope that this new building and this new concept will strengthen and support the dialogue between the civil society and the decision makers. But what is most important is, of course, what is inside the walls. What does uh, this new library enable? Uh, what will it give access to? We believe we are building a library of the future, a new way of thinking how the library can service the people. This all started from the ideas and views of the library professionals to make a completely new and modern library that in addition to the traditional services will provide new services and facilities that will serve the people in this changing world. The society in Finland has changed rapidly. My parents lived in a completely different society than I have. The work life has changed. My parents' uh, generation uh, had long employments with the same employer for tens and tens of years. My generation, most, a lot of people are freelancers and self-employed. Uh, the media has changed. In my, in my childhood, we had a few newspaper and a few uh, TV news that painted the picture of the world to us. Now we have the internet, we have the social media. Um, the rhythm of life has changed. Society has uh, evolved into uh, functioning 24-7. Less and less people live the nine to five lives. And this was the change that the libra library needed to answer to. 
and we needed a whole new approach how to plan a public service like the library. After we saw the need for this, it started uh, years of political work which ended in the political support for the library not only in my city of Helsinki, but the government of Finland as well. Finland just last year celebrated its uh, 100 years of independence, and our government saw that the new big central library would be a great way to celebrate our independence by investing in culture and education. And after the financial side was covered, started the work of planning what is the new library and what should it consist of. This is also an amazing example of how to participate the people, how to engage the citizens who use the library. There has been several workshops, discussions and possibilities to vote, many several ways in how the people have been able to sell what they hope from this new library. We have also tried something we call participatory budgeting. This means to give the people power to decide over a part of the budget. Um, it means that the customers can make decisions on how we use the money. They have the possibility to influence in what kind of spaces are created, to the small facts of what kind of magazines should be available and provided. This uh, participating budgeting was such a success that now we are implementing it in a larger scale in our city. As we know, unfortunately, money is power, but by giving the people the chance to decide how the money is spent is giving the power to the people. Participating people like this helps us build services in the way that the customers hope. And most importantly, it makes the libraries the people's own. When they participated in the planning, it creates a sense of ownership. And this creates trust and social ac acceptedness for investments like this, and then it makes it easier for politicians to make wise choices. Now my computer died out. I will continue because I know that new technology doesn't always work, so I have <laughs> been prepared. Yes. <laughs> so, um, what, what did people want in the new library? This is about exactly how it's going to look. I've been in the work uh, looking at the construction site and this is about to come out. Um, what people wanted, they wanted uh, the traditional library services, but they also wanted spaces to work in and tools to work with. They wanted free space to just to hang out and meet friends, but they also wanted completely silent spaces in this hectic world we live in. They wanted possibilities to organize events themselves, and they wanted free spaces that can be used in the future for whatever thoughts will come up. And Audi is all of these things. It's a place that I would say that changes us as library users. We transform from passive users to active producers. It's a free space for everyone, where everyone has the possibility to find their own voice and to make that voice heard. This project, project is about engaging and empowering people. We in Finland just recently had a study that shows that still in these days, libraries have a significant impact on literacy. In this global world, where most of us have access to the internet and therefore to an incredible amount of information, we need media literacy. We need information literacy, tools to process all of this information. How to separate lies from the truth. How to navigate the endless internet and the vast flood of information. We hope that our new library will do this, to give everyone the tools they need in the new media field, and also give the tools to produce themselves. The new challenge we have today is to be able to keep everyone uh, along with the fast digitalization of society, that it shouldn't be uh, the size of your wallet that gives you the opportunity to be a part of the digital world. This is one big uh, challenge our libraries have today, and to this challenge we hope that this new library will also uh, uh, answer. And this project would never have been possible without the library professionals, their knowledge and their views, without their understanding of how the libraries can answer and provide in the changing world. But it would not have been possible without the Finnish people who love their libraries and who trust their libraries.
And this trust is earned every day in every meeting with the customers. So, to make great library stories, in my point of view, as a politician, we need two things. We need the library professionals who are bold to try new ideas. And we need the people whom to cooperate with so new ideas fit the need of the customers. If we, if we have these two, even a politician knows what to do. <laughs> so, as cities, as countries, uh, they build upon us people. A country is its people, and so a library is also its users. And we need the mindset change I think we need is to have the courage to listen to the people and give space for new things to grow. The time where somebody tells us from above what we need is over. Thank you for being a part of this. Thank you, Sylvia, for these great thoughts and also thank you for uh, this wonderful uh, presentation of the uh, new library in Helsinki, which will be an enormous success, I think. But I'm also grateful that you gave this principle of not giving orders from above to do it in an inclusive way of a creation. This is exactly where we in EFL are going with the Global Vision Project and building up a new strategy with you. Thank you that you have given us the pass also in this way. So, now we are coming to the second part with great past presidents to get uh, their input. And we will start with Claudia Lux. I know that Claudia will be familiar to many of you it's hard to believe sometimes that it was back in 2007 to 2009 that she was EVLA president. And I want to give some personal notes to it. When I came in the library field uh, mid of the 90s, I was also a journalist before and I got the offer to become uh, Secretary General of the Austrian Library Association. Maybe you are not surprised, I wanted to change the Austrian Library Association. And as uh, Ingrid said, I tried to set up windmills and to break down walls, but you need their strong alliances for it, and I searched for it. And uh, just to go back also as a librarian, mid of the 90s, there was not so much in the internet to find. It was not easy to get information. It was more institutional information there, mid of the 90s. But then I find the EFLA journal, and I got a speech which um, Claudia gave at the, at the EFLA Congress in Istanbul, and I was fascinated of this uh, article in the EFLA journal. And I thought, this is exactly the woman I need to inspire the Austrian people to go for change. And at my first conference, which I organized, I invited Claudia, and she inspired me through my whole professional career. And when she became then, uh, already then, as director of the uh, Berlin State Library and, uh, the, um, and as president of the German Library Association, when then she became president of IFLA, she had an inspiring, really, theme set libraries on the agenda. This was a milestone for me in the history of EFLA to send out the signal how to change it. And she started really to change EFLA to make it to an effective modern organization. Yeah, that was a great start. But she still continued. She had after this still the energy to become a director for uh, building up the National Library in Qatar, and she gives still her energy uh, to IFLA as mentor for our Young Leaders program. And I guess the, all our young leaders can be happy, as happy we are that she is here now with us. Please, Claudia, start. Thank you very much. Um, 
Uh, it's really hard to say anything when he is always talking that everybody is inspiring, but uh, maybe I'm not today. However, uh, what they asked me to say is something uh, what I thought when I started this uh, IFLA presidency and uh, why I choose my theme. So I have a little bit prepared to tell you about something about this. Um, so. First of all, in 2005, uh, before I became, or just when I became president-elect, uh, my, uh, my observation here in IFLA, and not only in IFLA, but also in my own library association, was that there is too much discussion and quarrels inside of the library world. And uh, always only on library topics, and we have a little bit circled around ourselves. In reality, it was a wrong perception, I can say, because now I know that even the presidents before those you see here, they have worked on UNESCO levels, on other political levels, but they really, they haven't shared it. Or they haven't shared it in a way that you can understand. And now when you see what IFLA is doing now, that everybody really is an advocate I think that is a big change, even from uh, the start of my uh, theme, Libraries on the Agenda. And there was also, maybe not outside, but inside of the library um, world, a feeling that the perception about libraries outside is bad. Okay, sometimes that might be right. I have worked in a lot of, uh, been in a lot of countries, and, uh, but this negative mindset about the perception of libraries in society and by governments and governmental bodies is something I was really cared about. I thought that cannot stay like that. And last but not least, I was angry. I was very angry that in Berlin, my city, the operas in a metropolitan city, and not only in Berlin, they get much more money and all the libraries serving very few people compared to libraries. And I think this mixture makes it that you are bored, that you see that there are some wrong ideas, and you are angry. And that takes you to become a IFLA president <laughs> with a good theme. <laughs> <laughs> And there was another thing which uh, you might know from, some of you know, uh, who have been in Berlin at that time, uh, Berlin had a mayor. And the mayor, uh, that time when Berlin was really a little bit poor after the wall came down and we had to uh, get into um, uh, this uh, t uh, east and west and uh, uh, had to spend so much money on this and so uh, he had a slogan, and the slogan was, Berlin is poor but sexy. <laughs> and if you have this, you see like librarians, whatever we are and whatever our perception is of ourselves, uh, we are sexy. And that's something, not only with the, I don't want to repeat the fashion again for tomorrow, but it's a great session, however, uh, this is what you have to change in the perception of the governments, of the politician, where you are talk with. So when you come and when you talk with them, you have to be different. Um, what also was very great, when, um, uh, when you take up uh, uh, libraries on the agenda, um, First of all, that you are there, and then uh, Ellen has to do put something on it, as she said. Um, you, uh, you see that this was a slogan, it was taken up worldwide. So I could go to many countries, and many countries had worked on it and knew it. And there was this element, how to approach politician from our side. And I had one, one experience which I'm still sharing with my students at the university in Berlin, that when I wanted to change the Senate library I was a director of at that time, uh, in the beginning of uh, 1991 to, to 2007, 
I, uh, to, to 1997, um, I wanted to have the computers, all the, the library system and so on. And uh, I really, I was taken back by people from the administration telling me, no, 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 you have to, you have in your investment, you have uh, some typewriters and maybe you can get some electronic typewriters or things like that. And uh, I was really shocked about that situation. And there was an old um, administrator and I was talking to him, I said, I try the best, but the cultural ministry, I cannot change their mind in this. And he says, in the moment when you are stuck in your administration, you have to go to the politician. And you know you are not allowed to do that. You do it in a way that they don't know it or that they don't see it. And that's exactly what I did. So I talked with politician. I was well prepared. I had everything on half page. They cannot read more, things like that. And uh, in reality, I got it. I don't tell the whole story here. I can tell it anywhere else. But, um, and I got the money. And I could change the Senate library completely into a very modernized uh, library. And the, the way that you can approach people and that they give you the money, and they give you a lot of money, if you come with their theme, if you have the knowledge, what is their theme, and as we are libraries, we can pick everything from our library as we serve everything in the world, we have something from their theme in our library. We can connect it. And in the moment you connect these two things, so his theme was outsourcing. And so I put, took outsourcing as a theme, uh, even that I had no IT, but I outsourced it. You understand? Okay, so I got IT from outside. Normally you first have it and outsource, outsource it. But this is what they were, the wording was it. The buzzwords. Sometimes they really look for the buzzwords for their, uh, their own agenda. And if you align it with is, you have a great chance to put your issue on the agenda. However, for other aspects of my presidency, it's the same. You also need to have those people who support your ideas. And uh, when I went in, uh, I think that was 2007, yes, 2007, I went to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I just say, I just want to talk about you because you have a great project on libraries, IT in libraries, computers in libraries. And I have, and you have also an issue, what I read in your paper, that you want to do it in a sustainable way. And you are looking for sustainability. I have an idea for your sustainability. Give the money to IFLA. We are the libraries. We are the librarians, and in the future, this organization will stay, and we'll make one thing which makes libraries stable and sustainable. When they have the power and the, the competence to talk to politicians and to, uh, to convince them. Because if you give money and if you have the government for a year or two for a project, as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation did. That is excellent, that is great. But looking for sustainability, you might have different politicians coming up and you need different, uh, different librarians. And the librarians have to be trained how to do the right advocacy to, to make this ongoing, to get this future money for these kind of projects. So it was my own surprise uh, that I took it up, and we had the first million, uh, one million dollar on the Durban conference uh, announced. And I'm really happy that all the others, including uh, Jennifer, uh, our former Secretary General, uh, and, uh, and now uh, the, the new team here with Gerald and um, Gloria, have worked with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and also without the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and especially uh, you, 
uh, we would not have been uh, in the chance to get this, uh, this for the organization. So it's not only with a politician outside, also with your partners uh, to work together uh, to make this advocacy uh, the first. And uh, one of the other aspects I saw when I, when I talk with uh, colleagues is how is the perception, if, you, or if they complain about the perception in their society about librarians, I say, how is your perception, your person, personal perception in your family? Do they know what you're doing? Huh? Do they know what you are doing? Do they really know? Or do they think you read books during your work? <laughs> okay, so maybe we have still a lot more to do uh, to be uh, that every librarian becomes an advocate. And I think we really have to talk about what we are really doing uh, to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I love to be in this sexy session, by the way. <laughs> and you have given me a new idea. Now I know why I'm so happy as Secretary General. I love to be the Secretary General of such a sexy institution. That's great, <laughs> really. Yeah. Thank you again, Claudia, for your ideas. Yeah, and now we are going to invite Donna Shida here to the stage. Donia, Donna will be definitely familiar to many of you, and she has many friends here, and it's true that just last year you were here and moderated this session. For those who didn't know, Donna is our immediate past president, and she came from us to the, from the Library of Congress, where she uh, served in many senior positions and uh, she has a lot of experience also in library associations and organizations, was involved in, in EFLA before in major positions and also president of the Special Library uh, Association. And Donna was president, as I said, from 2015 to 2017 and chose Libraries, a call to action as her theme, and this fits absolutely to Donna, I can say this theme, because she is so powerful and full of energy, and she has really the idea to bring libraries to action, and I can really underline this because I know I had the privilege to work with her during the last years, and she was also um, she motivated so many uh, of our colleagues to go further with actions and she deserves so much of recognition for the change we are making happen today. Donna President's meeting focused on building a change agenda for the profession and launching our global vision process and she presided over our conferences in Columbus and Wroclaw. Many thanks that you are with us, Donna. Please, the stage is yours. Welcome her, please, with a warm applause. Thank you very much, Gerald, for that kind introduction. Um, I am going to try to be uh, quick. The closer you are to something, the more there is to say. Um, so I'm going to try to edit myself down. Now, my background um, in changing mindsets uh, comes from, I started out as um, a championship, on a championship high school debate team. And debate is all about constructing arguments and trying to win people to your side. Um, I've also been involved in local politics in the District of Columbia and have chaired some, some community advisory associations and have also been involved in uh, party politics as a, 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 the District of Columbia a, a, a par a party chair. And uh, so this teaches you a lot too about um, how, how to, ch how t it's not sometimes changing mindsets as it's trying to bring mindsets together to do the right thing. I think that's what politics is all about, is trying to bring people in leadership together to see where their common goals are so that together they can, they can accomplish something. 
So when I got the call to tell me that I was going to be the president-elect, that I had won the election, uh, after I scraped myself off the ceiling, I was so excited, um, I started thinking, and I had two years as well, to start, um, as president-elect, you go around already and, and start talking to, at library association meetings and observing wonderful examples of libraries in the countries that you visit. I was also inspired by the IPLA trend report. Thank you very much, Ingrid. That was an incredibly important turning point for IPLA, I think, because what happened was we started conversations all around the world about what the trends, the societal trends, meant to libraries. So I also had the advantage of all that information that you were giving us through these, these trends. Um, but what wasn't being made clear to people was that trends represent change. And I am of the firm conviction that with change, there's, there's two possibilities. You either create the change you want to see that will make you, your libraries, your profession successful, or you don't do anything, and then you have to live with the changes that are created by others, which might not be so good for us. So that led me to my theme, libraries, a call to action. We needed to act. We needed to create our own future. So um, I loved what Gloria was talking about in terms of the psychologist um, experiment, because I often think one of the biggest barriers to change is that it's, it, it, what, what do I change? How much? It's, it's big. It's, it's huge and it becomes overwhelming. So I thought the first thing I needed to do was to provide a framework for how to think about this. So off came the four levels of change, personal changes, institutional changes, and for this particular segment right here, um, there was national policy and, and global policy changes. And without change at happening and converging from all those levels, it won't work because there are many things we want to do in our libraries, but um, there may be national policies or global policies like copyright um, that provide barriers to us. So, so once we were working th towards the change agenda, um, there were also some other very important opportunities that happened. There were two major, major ones for me. The first was the, um, the work at the UN. And I have to thank um, Stuart Hamilton particularly, because by the time I became president-elect, a lot of work had already gone on to position access to information to be part of the sustainable development goals. But the UN is very complex. And one of the things that happens there is once you make a gain, you have to be vigilant and persistent about defending it. And um, so we, we, we did as much work to make sure that access to information was not removed during the debate as we did to try to in, encourage more discussion about it. And uh, I wanted, and then this, the other thing that happened that was very, very important was um, my governing board had the opportunity to select a new secretary general. And the governing board was, was very uh, visionary and said, um, we want our finalists to come in with a vision for IFLA. Uh, that was part of the interview. And uh, to use an American, uh, American expression, um, Gerald Leitner knocked our socks off with his vision. <laughs> and uh, we were very fortunate because this also infused new energy. So, so what did I, I'm gonna share a couple of lessons that I, I, I learned. First of all, as I went around the world talking, I could see that there were great changes happening in places, but they were pockets of excellence, and that we really needed to leave no library behind. And the reason that, that we needed to do that is that people's impressions and their perception of their library is formed by the one that they use. And if it is really good and does all these really neat things and builds community, then they think libraries are great and all libraries are do that do that. But if it's a library that's stuck in the old paradigm of libraries, um, then they think that's what all libraries are like. So we must make sure that this is an inclusive, inclusive process. Um, the other, the other uh, thing that I want to talk about, or the, 
the lessons from, from the United Nations. There's four, there's four things, really. Um, the first is that we're most effective when we develop partnerships and coalitions. So by the time I got to the UN and I was allowed to speak there, uh, we had the Leon, over 600 um, uh, signatories at, um, on the Lyon Declaration. And what that allowed me to do was to say, journalists, um, technology associations, uh, human rights organizations, and libraries all agree together that access to information is the foundation for reaching every other goal. No other goal is achievable without information. So having that coalition really helped our case, and I could tell by the questions that I was asked by the chairs and the delegates afterwards. Second lesson, all politics is local. So it's important to note that while we were working at the UN, national library associations and individual librarians were asked to contact their delegations, which very many did. Politicians respond favorably when they know what their constituents think. So without your work, that effort might have failed, and I thank you very much for that. The third is every librarian needs to be an advocate. Once the SDGs were published and libraries were positioned as part of the infrastructure, the focus at IFLA shifted to follow-up. National association and librarians needed to work with their national decision makers to put libraries in their national development plans. The IFLA advocacy program became focused on supporting this effort. And IFLA gave, gave librarians and is still giving librarians the tools. And one of the most important tools is the development and access to information report. Because politicians like data, but also now with the library map of the world and in the report there are stories. Because what politicians remember are the stories about how their constituents were helped. And that's where their, that's where their hearts align with your goals. And finally, we need to stop talking to ourselves all the time and bring our message to forums where we can form critical partnerships and raise awareness of leaders of other sectors of society about how libraries can be their partners in achieving societal goals. Since leaving the presidency, I've been fortunate to continue to be of service, and, um, but in places where I'm the only librarian, uh, a woman's, uh, the Carter Center had a, a, a very compelling con work conference and working group on women and access to information. And the gender gap in terms of access to information is very serious and something that we need to focus, I think, more attention on. Um, it, it has led to other invitations for me to bring the library message to non-library-centered meetings, including the U.S. Internet Governance Forum. So I feel that all librarians are answering the call to action, but the call will never be over. As our world continues to change at an even faster pace, we must be courageous and relentless in our work to ensure we do our part that every citizen is literate, informed, and can fully participate in society. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. It was great to hear you again here, and I think some of you heard uh, Donna the first time, and it was great to get her insights again, and you can imagine how much power she had during her presidency, to speak. Uh, last but definitely not least, I want to invite Gloria, our president, back to the floor to give her perspectives. I don't think I have to introduce her really long, but we, what we know is she is a librarian by heart, and she will talk, tell you all how, what it means to be a librarian by heart. Please. Thank you, Vera. Thank you. So I want really to start this just a brief uh, introduction of this, this second part. Uh, th thinking to all of you, your inspiration, but also the bold idea uh, of Gerald to have this session with all of you. So thank you for this bold uh, idea, because could would be as well controversial, but we are seeing not. We, in a way, we are aligned, and, and we have many thoughts that uh, we are sharing since many years ago. So I want to tell you something that um, I really think can help librarians all over the world, that is, is important for us, not just 
to high level management or direction of uh, associations and so is something that I really think can, uh, can be um, not a model to follow, but the way that I started thinking about changing my mindset. Uh, my experience in library management began in 1996 when I was director of the Public Libraries Network in Badalona, um, my home where I'm living. And I, I participated in the, in, I had the opportunity to participate in the analysis of library program uh, was carried out by the Beltasman Foundation, you know, most of you know. Uh, it was my starting point in operating in, um, and, and opening, in a way, my eyes to the need for a strategic library management. Since at that moment, I was just a librarian. I was the director of an, uh, a public li uh, network, but I was a librarian. I was not really a manager. I was not really a, a director seen and looking for the future. So this was my open eyes. Um, and I started to, to uh, thinking about uh, how to uh, shape to draw library services to cover users' needs and emerging demands. This was the, the central focus of me, thinking about what they needed to have in our libraries. So I work hard to achieve this, and I deliver face-to-face -face and online training courses across Spain as well, because uh, uh, um, Bertelsmann Foundation asked me to, to be really a, a partner of them doing this work in, in Spain. And I wrote also several articles, you can find very old articles, about how much libraries uh, have to be aligned with citizen needs, uh, and especially under the new paradigm of uh, the information society. I used to ask myself two questions that I really think we had all of us to ask, not every day, but every few months. Are we librarians ready to take uh, this new way of planning public services? Because they are public services as well. And public services means to serve public, to, do, to just uh, face what they, they need and plan for them. Are we librarians ready to make change happen in libraries? These two questions must be answered so often, really. As slowly but surely, I started to realize that I um, and think about the need of change uh, in, lib in librarians' mindsets and as necessary condition for this. A key moment uh, came in 2014 as an IFLA governing board member. My thoughts came focused on the broader library community at that moment. Uh, there were two main reasons for this. Firstly, the IFLA report that you mentioned and I really uh, appreciated at that moment and uh, I learned a lot of things about the trends in, in, the, in the consumption of information for uh, the general public and users, uh, was a great report, really, was a great report of the, of the, Nation, uh, the International Federation of Library Association, of FIFLA, but uh, I was surprised to see nothing about the information needs and opportunity of librarians. Nothing was included there. Librarians' work does not appear in the trend report. And, and this really worries, worried me a lot. And secondly, regarding the financial crisis, this affected our library services immensely, especially in Spain. It was a tough crisis and a crucial moment uh, for the Spanish library field because it was in a, in a starting development. And this struggled uh, to deal with such an awful situation. So uh, Spanish librarians had to reinvent their role and learn how to advocate for libraries, convincing uh, our local and national governments to the importance of libraries for society. They had to fight to avoid more budget cuts because was constantly closing libraries, uh, uh, losing uh, staff was terrible. And a methodology was defined to demonstrate that libraries contribute to a competitive economy. It provides libraries managers with arguments to defend their position against the competition of other sectors. Because as Claudia said, the money went to the opera house, the money went to the main museums, but, and they had very few, uh, very few uses, very few visits, compared with the millions of visits we have every year in the, our library system. So I was really upset, and I, I, I joined with you this idea. 
So uh, with these uh, tools uh, to, uh, of managers for being competitive, we learn to give the message, libraries are an investment and not an expense. So libraries is not a cost in any, in any way, it's really an, an, an investment. Why? Because these two points are really reinforcing my idea and I work my concerns and also my reaction. I did, I was so upset and I react. This is also sometimes very convenient. And concern about this, uh, how the financial crisis had hit the Spanish libraries, I urge the library sector not only to focus their efforts on evaluating as specific results and indicators about collection, building, or uh, library uses and visitors, no. We provide, from FESAVIT, we provide librarians in Spain for tools which proved the social value of libraries. Special, specific tools. This is the main we have to act. We have really to work. Not just with words. Words are very nice, and they are very good ideas, but we really think we have to convince this polit uh, the decision makers, the politicians, that we really have to change the mindset to invest in libraries. So um, in Lyon, uh, in 2014, during the public libraries opening session, I presented a lecture called um, librarians facing the crisis, action. Uh, it was really funny because a uh, few months, uh, a few weeks later, I saw that uh, Donna was also using this action because it's, we need to react, we really need to put uh, our ideas into action. In which I tried to demonstrate that libraries are a social investment in both FESAVIT, uh, Spanish Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, and Diputació de Barcelona, my own organization, both reports the conclusion showed the importance of libraries to society. They use methodologies for calculating the return of investment, the ROI. So uh, what is in libraries giving back to the society? Even giving concrete figures, we said hard numbers to show key uh, truth. So we're not just nice words. There was proof that we really were a value for the social environment. This was the start of my analysis of the situation uh, we were facing, and I started to see clearly that, in general, librarians were not aware what how much libraries can give back to people, or how librarians can demonstrate to governments that libraries are keystones for individuals and communities' development. I have to recognize that still is too early for me to evaluate what uh, is the hardest thing to deal uh, with in terms of uh, people mindsets during my presidency is too, is too early still. But I see sometimes several wise, skeptical librarians thinking they don't have to be involved in development. They don't look at themselves as main actor, actors for a real change. And unfortunately, they want to carry on always forever. So I believe this forever will not exist anymore if we don't change our mindsets, is really what I'm thinking. So during the IFLA Global Vision Regional Workshops, uh, we heard that uh, there are still many librarians complaining, suggesting that the library field is risk adverse, being passive rather than acting for change. They believe that they can change every single challenge into the opportunity for improvement. Looking back now, in IFLA, we are looking uh, and working hard today, facing new challenges, and, and new changes are coming in different ways. Working on IFLA's transformation, as we had said these uh, two days of a conference. We're trying to see what we have to deliver to engage librarians all over the world. The executive report of the first phase of the Global Vision launched in Barcelona last March gives us a new landscape of how to face challenges and work on, our, on the opportunities for the library field. This shows optimism that there is a realistic opportunity for change. Today, I'm certain, totally certain, we are truly changing 
also acting on a new IFLA strategy with all inputs of the future because IFLA is all of us. And all uh, your voices, our voices count. We're seeing day after day uh, what more we can do together as a United Library field to change our own mindsets. I can imagine, uh, I, I really want to imagine that my speeches and uh, of course, of course uh, President-elect, Secretary General, members of the governing board, chairs and officers' uh, speeches in the library conferences we attend, uh, we attend are helping. I really want to imagine this, it is happening. Um, but um, I really think, and it, it was already said, because we are sharing these ideas, that uh, every, uh, we really need in the library field that every librarian has to be an advocate. I love this slogan, librarian to be an advocate, advocate for the needs we have. I guess all of you by now will know my slogan, libraries as motors of change, a motto that expresses a movement indeed. I still believe that uh, we librarians are the gears of the motors of change, a worldwide movement of librarians that are speaking up and acting as real advocates for libraries. We need every single librarian to join IFLA movement. So online and you librarians, uh, re uh, remember always, um, join this movement and let's move up a gear. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria, again for this powerful message uh, to all of you. And I want to thank also the uh, speakers of uh, the other speakers of this uh, second part, Claudia and Donna. Uh, I have prepared many questions to our presidents, but as they have so many ideas and they have so much experience, they have spoken a bit longer as intended and I have to close the session very soon. We are very thankful for your thoughts, but unfortunately we cannot discuss with you further what I wanted to discuss with you. You see, there are many interesting questions for them and I will have the privilege to talk with them in the evening about, yeah? Unfortunately, not here. But I want to give one question to each of you and it was for me, Ellen, who hit the nail for me when she, when she spoke about a new theme, what she would choose. And I ask you now, if you were to pick a slogan today for the field to work with politicians, funders and others. What would it be for you? Ellen, it was for you. Can you repeat your, uh, your slogan which you, gave, which you gave? It was really great. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. <laughs> that, that makes it, yeah? Uh, maybe uh, Claudia can continue. I think in the, uh, in the area where we are now uh, that uh, the participation of everybody is uh, more possible and is needed and libraries really have to go out and uh, have to showcase. Uh, I think uh, for me it would be just in this year where there is 70 years of human rights, uh, I would say libraries defending your rights. Wow, great powerful message too. Donna, can you hear you? I, I think the new focus um, that we have on community, and I mean the word community in the broadest sense for academic, li for all kinds of libraries, their users, I would say li libraries build our communities. Super. Sinica. I must say, I... I it was hard for me to find a new slogan because there have been so great slogans oh. all the time here. This means you will yeah. support all the other slogans. Yes. Great. Yes. Ingrid. Oh, well, I agree too. There's so many important messages and slogans, but I'm a Canadian and um, I 
I don't know if you know our ice hockey legend, <laughs> but we do have one called Wayne Gretzky. Um, and he said once, and he, he said, I move to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And that slogan has been used, oh, in thousands of PowerPoint presentations in corporations and companies. They love that slogan. But I think for us, it means, you know, let's aim for where the information world is going to be, not where it is now. Um, it's just looking forward into, into the future. Thank you, Ingrid. Wonderful. Me Gloria. Too. So being consistent with what they said, I really choose one slogan that is, libraries are an investment for development. I will choose this slogan. Yeah. What do you think? Do you agree? Yeah, great. I think you know now why IFLA is a successful, powerful organization. This president made it happen that IFLA is really the global voice of libraries and it's a legacy for us to develop it further. And what we are doing is, uh, luckily, with even bigger funding of global libraries, as uh, uh, Claudia told, that my predecessor built up trust and, show, and has shown that IFLA is able to do and, and I guess on this we could build up to make it even bigger and more successful. And this money of the legacy from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a game changer also for IFLA because we can do things different as it was possible for the former governing board and for the former presidents. We can reach out more, we can more work with you in your region, we can go to you and the result of it is this global vision report with the input from 190 countries, what was not possible before. And on this we will build up now and we are going they are further, and I ask you to join us in the afternoon, in the session where we speak about of our future, of our vision, of our future, a strong and united labor field, powering literate, informed, and participative societies. And we will have the session here in this room, and there we need your input to create the idea stores today at 1:45 your ideas here, and I hope we will get also the input of our former presidents to make the field stronger, to create our future together. We are counting on you. See you back here at 1.45.